Welcome everyone. My name is Henry Kinze and I'm an equity analyst here at AVG. With me now, I have the CEO of Sintercast, Steve Dawson, uh, here to answer some questions uh, about his company. Should we uh, just uh, maybe start off uh, by you giving us a brief summary of Sintercast's uh, mm -hmm. product and business activities? <clears throat> yeah, so we're a technology company. Uh, we've developed a technology to control a new type of cast iron called compacted graphite iron. Um, compacted graphite iron is stronger and stiffer than the normal iron. And the ideal application for CGI is when you have simultaneous thermal and mechanical load. So mechanical pushing and pulling and bending and thermal heat. And so the main application for CGI is in engines. And there we obviously have the mechanical load and we have the heat from the combustion. Um, as CGI is stronger and stiffer, we can make the engines smaller and lighter. We can push them harder so they're more efficient, so less fuel consumption and lower emissions. So it is uh, smaller, lighter, better on the road and cleaner. Um, we're primarily active in large engines. So last year, now with the full year results available, we were 51% commercial vehicle, mostly heavy duty truck. Uh, we were 30% super duty pickups, the large pickups in the US, and 10% full size pickups like F-150. We were 5% mid size pickup, that's Ford Ranger, Volkswagen, Amarok. Um, and also some SUVs in that sector, and 4% off-road, so construction, agriculture, marine, and rail. And we don't have any exposure to car. Uh, we were less than 1% car last year. Right. So that's an um, interesting technology for the um, truck and um, um, business. Uh, but uh, how do you make your money? What's the business model here? Uh, we have a really strong business model. In those early years, we really insisted on it and it was accepted. And um, so more than 90% of our revenue is recurring revenue. Um, it's basically a royalty. We don't use that word in the industry. We call it a production fee. And um, so about two thirds of our running revenue is from the production fee. And one third is from our exclusive supply of the consumables. And the rest of our revenue comes from um, extending existing installations, new installations, engineering service, spare parts, uh, the normal stuff. And um, it's a strong model. We had a revenue last year of 134 million. Uh, we're a small company. We don't do the manufacturing. Yeah, we're just 28 people. Um, so the revenue was 4.5 million crowns per employee. Um, I say we're very profitable, so we had a profit margin last year of 32%, and that works out to a profit of 1.5 million crowns per employee. So think of us as a software house. Um, we're 28 people, um, most of them sitting at the technical center here in Katharina Holm. Uh, we have local representation employees uh, in China, Korea, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and the US. Mm. Yeah, all right. So you've been uh, with the company for most your uh, career. Uh, <clears throat> just tell us a bit about uh, your experience getting the company where it is today. Yeah. Uh, um, good question. Thank you. So I joined the company in November of 91. Um, at that time, the innovators of Sintercast, uh, they reasoned that Detroit was the global capital of the auto industry. <laughs> So they packed up their company and put the head office in Detroit. And when they were there, they recruited locally. Um, I was working in the US steel industry at the time. I'm a Canadian. I did my education in Canada, but I was working in the US. Um, they had a headhunter and he found me. Um, had really good discussions with the then president. I thought it was a really obvious thing. There was an obvious demand in the market, so I was uh, interested to join. It made a lot of sense to me. Um, I was the technical director from 91 until 2002. 
And maybe that was a difficult period for the commercial side and the executive management, but for me, because we were pre-revenue, uh, but for me as technical director, um, you know, we were taking the ideas of the innovator into a product. So it was hardware development, software development, and for me, the metallurgy, the solidification of the cast iron and controlling that. So developing a product that we could install in the foundry and have it carry the innovator's ideas. Um, at the same time, we were out with the car and truck companies because they didn't know the material. So we had to explain it to them and also work with them so they could understand how they could benefit from it. Uh, we developed a material property database um, that was really exciting for me as a young engineer. Um, and we were working in parallel with the foundries. You know, CGI, uh, the industry tried to do it in the 1970s and they failed. And they tried again in the 1980s and they failed. And so when Sintercast showed up in the 1990s and said, we can do this, it, there was a lot of skepticism. Um, it was an uphill uh, battle. Um, but, you know, we, you work with the ones who are open-minded. We established our first few references. In um, 1999, we had our first uh, series production. It was 3.3 liter V8 for Audi. Um, it was only used in the Q8, so the volumes were modest. We were around 8,000 per year. Um, in June of uh, 2001, we got our first high volume order. That was with Ford and Jaguar Land Rover. And that production started in 2003. And I haven't done the math, but I guess since then we've had uh, somewhere around 13, 14, 15% compounded annual growth. Um, and now the thing becomes a full cycle. So in September, we announced a succession plan for me as CEO. Um, that uh, individual, Dr. Vitor Anos, um, he joined us on January 1. Um, really good first two months. Um, this year he works primarily inside the company to learn everything about uh, Sintercast and the way we do things. Um, next year it will be a lot more with me out in the field. Um, I foresee that in January of 2026 he'll step forward and take the lead and I'll be there as a supporter. And the idea is that we finalize the transition at the uh, annual general meeting in May 2026. So for me, it's just uh, another project. I like projects and I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, it sounds like you have a solid plan for, uh, for the success. It's a Sintercast way. Yes, of course. All right, before getting into the long-term picture, let's talk mm -hmm. a bit about 2023. Um, you had some strong quarters this year. There was a bit of a production stoppage in Q4 at one of yeah. your uh, customers, but uh, how would you summarize uh, the year? Uh, it was a good year. You know, you can have okay years and good years and really good years. Um, it was better than okay, so it was a good year. Uh, we always target 10% growth. Mm -hmm. That's our target every year. Um, our growth was 6.3%. Revenue was 13. Um, so consumable sales were strong. Installations were up. We were 4 million in 2022 and 6 million in 2023. And the U.S. dollar pitched in a little bit, so mm. on the revenue side, we were 13% up. Um, we started the year slow. Um, one of our high-volume programs was doing a model year changeover, and so that volume was uh, really low, and that impacted us. Um, but we had a really strong middle of the year. After three quarters, I was thinking that uh, we were up 6%. I was thinking that uh, we had a fighting chance to get to 9 or 10, so I was really optimistic. In the end, the fourth quarter was a bit flat. Um, you mentioned this uh, one program that, uh, or not program, but rather production line yeah. that stopped. That was for maintenance issues. It was completely unrelated to us. Um, but uh, in total, they were down for 35 days in November and December. Um, that affected us for about 300,000 or, you know, Mm. close to 10% of our volume. And the other thing that got us in the fourth quarter was uh, the original Scania foundry. So Scania has always had a foundry and we installed there in 2013. So we'd been supporting them for 10 years. And they then built a new foundry um, and that started production in January of 22, um, again with us. Um, so the new foundry has been ramping up and in December they closed the original foundry. Um, so there was a ceremony there on 7 December, and that meant that uh, we didn't have volume from mm. that foundry in December. Um, 
I'm not at all worried about that. Uh, we do 100% of Scania's CGI. So once the original foundry emptied its inventory in November, uh, and, you know, the whole thing will catch back up. Um, we do all of Scania's castings. We do it at the new foundry here in Sweden. We do it in Brazil. We do it in Mexico. Um, so in the end, it'll work its way through and, and we'll sell as much CGI to Scania as they sell trucks. Well, very good. So uh, how has this year started uh, then? Is that uh, stoppage uh, resolved? And uh, how are, uh, what's your view on 2024? Um, yeah, so the stoppage back to normal. Yeah. Um, they were good in uh, February. We, we just received the February results, I think on Monday of this week. We issued a press release about the first two months yesterday. So it's a good start. Um, January was 17% higher than our highest January, which was just last year. Um, January is always low. You, you have the carryover of the New Year shutdown, the Christmas and New Year shutdown period. Um, 50% or approximately 50% of our production is in Brazil. So mm. that's also summer shutdown for them. So January is always seasonally low. Um, February, we were 27% higher than our highest February, uh, which coincidentally was in February of 2020, um, just before the onset of COVID. Mm. And it's an apples to apples comparison because that was also a leap year. So it was a 29 day <laughs> February. Um, and March is usually good. You know, I think that March is the first, first full month of the year. So I'm really excited and looking forward to uh, the March results in the first quarter. Um, but the, it's a good start. Um, we're up 27% so far compared to last year. Um, you, you follow us, we have uh, had 11 consecutive quarters of year on year growth. And uh, the first quarter is now a, a for sure to get 12. Mm. Well, that sounds very good. Um, you also announced in August, uh, I think, that one of your long, uh, long term programs is reaching end of life uh, mm -hmm. this year uh, in the autumn. Uh, you, at the same time, you, you have some programs that are ramping uh, during mm -hmm. the year. Uh, could you just give us your view on how those factors uh, will affect um, the second half uh, of this year? Yeah, so I'll start with the final answer and then I'll come back to the individuals. So the final answer is that uh, we always target uh, double digits, so 10-ish and better than 10. Um, so whatever happens this year, we target uh, to be double digit in our growth. Last year was uh, 3.7 for full year. So to get 10%, we have to get to 4.1 million engine equivalents. Mm. Um, the first two months of the year were up and that's uh, 3.9. Um, after two months. So do I think that we can get to 4.1 for full year? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the program that will stop and, um, you know, it's a normal part of business. You have programs that uh, start and ramp up and you have programs that come to end of life. And um, that program had been on the bubble for about a year. We were working with our foundry partner and with the OEM to encourage it to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, by the time we got to June, July uh, last year, it looked like things weren't going our way. Um, and then in August, it became clear that a decision was, was about to be made. So we included that in our 2Q report uh, that was published in August, uh, August last year. Um, so yeah, it, it will be a discrete reduction in our production. So from today until um, summer-ish, uh, we will grow and then there will be a, a decrease. Um, we have said previously that it looks like the second half of this year. Uh, I think that uh, is going to be more summery than autumn-y. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll have this uh, discrete reduction and from there we carry on and we start growing again. Um, you mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, you mentioned two programs. So one is the new 13 liter engine for Scania, mm -hmm. which is used in the entire Trayton group. Um, Navistar, MAN, Volkswagen truck and bus. Um, we said from the outset that we'll get about 1 million incremental engine equivalents from that program. And we're not quite halfway through that ramp yet. So there's a lot of growth ahead. Some of that will be this year. A lot of it will be next year. Um, so, you know, we have a good horizon for mm -hmm. growth. 
And, and the other one that is uh, young and growing is FAW, First Automobile Works in China. Um, there they have developed a new engine family for a commercial vehicle. It's the way that people normally do it. Um, the sweet spot for commercial vehicles is 13 liter. And then once you have the 13 liter engine, frequently you make an 11 liter version and maybe a 15 liter version. And you, you speak of this family of engines. So FAW has a new family of engines coming. Um, we have the contract for the cylinder block uh, of those engines. Um, every year Europe sells around 250,000 commercial vehicles. Um, America sells around 300,000 and China is usually more than a million. And FAW is the biggest in China and they're normally about 300,000 so per year. So FAW alone is as big as Europe or America and, and we have the order. So it's going to be a strong growth. It, it will be a long ramp. We had thought the production would start before now, but um, everybody knows about the economic challenges in China over the last two years. The commercial vehicle market has been really low. I say they're normally over a million. The last couple of years, they've been around 700, 800,000. Mm. Looking forward this year, they forecast 1.2 million. And so hopefully that gets the whole thing rolling. Um, our engineers were there in uh, January um, to help them with uh, some development. Um, so yeah, I'm really optimistic about uh, FAW this year and for the next few years. Mm. Yeah. And that, that, that's what gives us this 10% confidence going forward. Yeah, let's uh, let's get into that. You you mm. announced uh, financial targets uh, this September, I think. Yeah, uh, and those uh, comprise double-digit uh, growth uh, through 2030. Uh, mm. You're also aiming to get the operating margin up above 40 percent. Uh, and finally, you aim to increase the dividend uh, every year, uh, and you're currently at a six percent yield uh, mm -hmm. there. So uh, could you just give us some color on what makes you confident uh, in these targets and, and how you're going to reach them? Um, so help me as we go through it. Uh, yeah. First, double digit growth. Yes. And um, we have a track record of that. As I said earlier, if you go all the way back to the beginning, we're probably 13, 14, 15 percent. That gets more difficult as the denominator gets bigger. Um, but now we're on uh, this 10 percent level. Um, I'm confident uh, in that. We're working on new programs. Uh, well, we have these two programs that are ramping. And we're working on other new programs. We have something that's going to start in 2028. We're working on a new program for 2030. So, you know, the pipe looks really good. Um, I think that we can maintain that 10% uh, growth level. Certainly that will be the target. Mm. Um, operating margin, yes. second one. Uh, yeah, the, the revenue will grow with this 10% increase. Um, the cost side will remain rather stable. Uh, we changed headcount from uh, 32 to 28 over the last uh, six or eight months. Um, we have a couple of more retirements coming, including me. <laughs> um, the replacement is either already in the company yeah. or, well, yeah, succession will come from within for all of those uh, internal retirements. Um, so there won't be an increase in cost unless inflation is silly. I think that we probably maintain constant cost level between uh, 2023 and 2028. Mm. Um, so, so that's the math on that. We were 25% operating margin in 2022, um, 31.8 last year. I think we we're 43 in the fourth quarter. Mm. Um, yeah. So we'll make steps toward that. Um, I don't think we stuck the chin out too far on that. You say they're aggressive targets, but I think um, they're very doable. Um, so uh, we'll hit that. What was the third part? Oh, the dividend. Was the ah, the dividend. Part, yeah. um, so what we've said is 25 consecutive years of increasing ordinary dividend. We've got 13 behind us. Um, the proposal is 14, mm -hmm. and I assume that uh, the proposal will be adopted by the shareholders at the AGM. So we're on 14. Um, with the increased operating margin, I think we can keep rolling it. Um, may get tougher as you get closer to 25, <laughs> but uh, we always talk about our five-year planning horizon, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, I'm confident that we uh, get the next five. Very good. All right, let, let, let's look at the market a little bit. Could you just uh, give us your comments on, on Sindra costs? 
position in the market. How, how large is this market uh, mm -hmm. for, for your technology? What, what share do you have now? What, what potential do you see forward? What regions uh, can you grow in? Yeah, mm -hmm. your view on that. Uh, so we've said for a long time that commercial vehicles will be our largest growth opportunity, and that's clear. That's where CGI is really needed. Um, today, maybe something like 40% of the market uses CGI. Um, as the demands increase, um, so the higher demand for performance means mm -hmm. horsepower and uh, pulling power, torque, um, and the demand for lower emissions uh, continues, people will push their engines harder, and that's always good for us. So we see the market um, evolving towards CGI. It won't be everybody, but it will be the majority, the clear majority of the market. Um, so commercial vehicles will be our main growth. Um, that means uh, in the West, Europe and uh, North America, um, also South America. Um, and we talked about FAW. So mm -hmm. I think that yeah. in the next five years, um, China, which is currently less than 1% of our revenue, will become significant. Um, we're at 4 million engine equivalents today. Um, we get to 5 million, that's clear. Um, I'm totally confident that we get to 7 million as well. And maybe we'll publish a roadmap for that mm -hmm. um, during my last uh, couple of years. <laughs> um, we are about uh, between 60 and 70% of the CGI uh, is produced with the Sintercast technology. So if you do 7 million and uh, we're at 67, so that means the total market is 11. And um, there's more growth to be had. Um, as I said, FAW as big as Europe. Um, just last week, we finished our installation at uh, Dongfeng, which is China's mm -hmm. second largest truck maker. So I think at the moment, uh, we're a bit conservative uh, in our outlook on what China can give us. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, we did a program with Tupi, our biggest uh, foundry customer, about uh, small petrol engines. Mm -hmm. So we used a... Uh, 1.2 liter aluminum engine from Peugeot, PSA, and we redesigned it in CGI such that the weight was the same. And that's really the reason why over the last 20 years, small engines have gone more and more to aluminum to save weight. Um, but we can uh, demonstrate uh, weight parity with CGI. So I think there's an opportunity in that as well. Tupi has done a really good job of promoting it. Um, there are some programs uh, underway. Let's see if we can get them across the finish mm. line. Um, but I would say in numbers, um, total market today, 11. China probably bigger than what we've given it credit for. Potential on the small stuff. I think addressable market is something like 15, 15 million. Yeah. So quite some room to grow then. Yeah, um, sure. So let's move on to... And quite some time as well. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Well, all right. Uh, so, so, so one concern that the investors have, of, of course, is um, that you, you are active in petrol and diesel uh, engines. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the past years, we, we have seen a lot of cries for electric uh, mm -hmm. uh, engines and, and things like that. Could you just <clears throat> give us your comments on what you're, you're seeing there at the moment? Yeah, I mean, the first thing to say is that we're all in big stuff. And the start of electric is mostly in small stuff. Um, we're less than 1% car. Um, and I think that uh, there was a real enthusiasm about electrification. There still is, but uh, a couple of years ago. Mm. Um, a new development is never easy. And I know that when we were new development in those uh, early years, um, there was a euphoria phase and everybody has a hockey stick. And, uh, and then you come to reality. And, and I think that the electrification thing is starting to move a little bit more toward reality. Um, in our biggest end user market in America, um, Ford has backed off on electric investment and they've reduced the production of the F-150 uh, Lightning, the electric pickup. And um, they say they're going to move to small cars. Um, General Motors has backed off on their timing, delayed the launch of their pickup by a full year. Um, they said that they would go straight from internal combustion to battery electric. And now they've backed off on that and said that they will go to hybrids. Um, and I think that hybrid is a better solution, uh, which of course uh, leaves an opportunity for internal combustion engine. And that's exactly what this uh, little ultralight engine mm. that we did with Tupi is about range extender and uh, secondary power. Um, 
Mercedes just last week backed off. They, they pushed out their target for electrification from 2025 to 2030 and now said that it will include hybrids instead of just battery electric. So, yeah, I think reality is starting to sink in. And, and that's for car. And it only gets more difficult when you go to larger vehicles where we work. Mm. Um, so still a lot of uh, challenge, um, infrastructure, cost, materials, consumer acceptance, driving range, charging time. Um, yeah, mm. it, it, it's a good enough solution. It will grow. It will find its place in the market. Um, but interesting quote from just last month from the chairman of Toyota in Japan, who used to be the president of Toyota, and he said uh, something like, uh, no matter what the development of batteries, um, battery electric vehicles won't take more than 30% of the market. So. Hmm. That's a pretty, pretty strong statement. From him. Yes, <laughs> from him, exactly. Uh, all right, finally, I just want to touch uh, upon uh, something which I, I noticed a couple of days ago that you posted on your, your LinkedIn uh, about uh, two-piece uh, heavy hydrogen uh, engine. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that got me curious. Is mm. our hydrogen engine some, something where uh, Sintracost technology can be applied? Well, absolutely, and we're in on that project. I was happy to be uh, invited to sit on the advisory board uh, for the project, together with Tupi AVL and uh, Westport. Um, I think... The debate is moving from engines to energy. And now people are talking about if we can use clean fuels, then engines are still a really good solution because, again, consumer acceptance, manufacturing facilities, distribution network, um, everything is there. So it's the easiest step. And if we can just use clean fuels, there are biofuels, renewable fuels, e-fuels, synthetic fuels. So a lot of this is coming net zero fuels. I think uh, what will come next in the debate is that uh, we'll start talking more about uh, defossilization instead of decarbonization and because we'll use carbon that is captured to make net zero fuels. So there's still carbon, but it's net zero. What we have to get rid of is the virgin carbon um, mm. from fossil fuels. Um, and in all of that, hydrogen seems to be gaining the momentum. Uh, we're on three hydrogen projects at the moment. One was at Tupi Project. Um, last year, MAN launched what they call their H38. It means a hydrogen engine with a 138 millimeter bore diameter. Mm -hmm. So it was a 16.8 liter commercial vehicle engine. Uh, we do the cylinder head on that um, exclusive supply together with Tupi. Um, so I think that hydrogen is becoming the bright path and uh, absolutely an opportunity for us. And I talk about our, um, you know, our production for commercial vehicles going well beyond 2035, and, and the opportunity there is that it just changes fuel, mm. but it doesn't really change base engine. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think it's a big opportunity for the industry and a big opportunity for Sintracast. Mm. All right, those are some very interesting comments. Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time now, so I'm going to have to thank you for this uh, interview and uh, thank you all for listening.